everybody to consider and maybe even do is to come closer, uh, move up. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's, there's no benefit of being in the back row. Uh, we want you to lean in um, because uh, today's discussion is really about uh, community in, in some ways. It's about uh, community in a certain context and, and certainly it draws on themes of resilience and cooperation and coordination. Uh, things that uh, our, uh, our guest speaker will speak to um, uh, fully in his presentation. Uh, but now that we've sort of pulled in, I also want to pull back a little bit and just say uh, that it's, it's appropriately, uh, appropriate that we're having this conversation about uh, those elements of community because we exist today as a community. Um, uh, and as the uh, working in the area of community relations and advancement, my name is Paul by the way. Uh, I have the great honor to, to, uh, to be working with our, our alumni group in terms of building uh, reputation and relationship out to the external community. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that is very important to consider in that context is history. Uh, so before we get going with today's formal presentation, just to acknowledge that, uh, that the university itself uh, uh, sits uh, at a particular time in history and reflects all of the strengths that come from a history that embraces um, storytelling and the lives lived by Coast Salish, by our Coast Salish uh, uh, people. Um, and while we don't, um, we don't own that narrative, uh, we have the great honor of reflecting it and sharing it in, uh, in conversations like that today. And so I would just like to acknowledge that we are on Coast Salish territory. Uh, here at the university. Um, as I had mentioned, um, uh, today's speaker, Ben um, Morgan, is currently the supervisor of crisis communications at the city of Calgary. Um, it's, uh, uh, I can't imagine a, a more active space to be practicing communications in uh, than through events such as that, that which we, um, we all kind of had some of, something of an experience of. Some of you may, may be from Calgary. Um, but I think that the, the points that I would draw, particularly relevant to the practice of communications, is just talking a little bit outside, that um, during those events, you know, you're, you're heavily dependent, heavily reliant on, uh, on cooperation, on building dependencies in order to be able to kind of respond uh, meaningfully to, to your community heavily dependent on a definition of facts uh, and working, uh, making sure that the information that you're providing to people is factually accurate. Uh, rumors are the enemy. Uh, there's so much myth busting that needs to take place in, in, those, uh, uh, in those events. And in many ways, I would suggest that um, in today's environment, those things are common to the practice of communications uh, for organizations uh, on an everyday basis. The thing that makes it different in the practice of crisis communications clearly is that you're working in a high stakes environment, um, that this quality of risk is very pronounced. And so those things become uh, much, more, much more important. So in, in Ben's presentation today, I think we'll, he's going to talk a, a little bit about uh, things that are core to the, to the kind of educational experience at, at Royal Roads, those themes of leadership, uh, of authenticity, and of partnership. And without saying anything more, I'm very proud and pleased to introduce Ben Morgan. Thanks, sir. So first of all, I gotta say thanks very much because I know it's lunch hour. And walking across campus, I was reflecting and thinking, oh gosh, here's one of those noontime things. I can either run back to my dorm and eat up a itchy van or I can go listen to the chachi that's in the room. So I appreciate you taking the time to, to come and, and hear what I have to say. Um, what I have to say is um, sharing a story and uh, you know, looking at the, the invite list, the Masters of Disaster Management, the Masters of Communications, the Bachelors of Communications, a really diverse uh, group to be speaking to, uh, I think it's a great group. It's a great mesh because what we're seeing is a change um, from those in disaster management and those in the other silo of communication 
finding new ways to work together. And uh, I think the audience or the invitation list speaks to that change and the recognition from the decision makers in disaster management, the recognition how critical communication is. So I'm Ben Morgan. I'm currently the supervisor of crisis communication and a convocate of Royal Roads two weeks ago. So um, I'm very pleased to have been extended the invitation to come back and, and talk to this group and as well as the live stream group. I know the city of Kingston and Mississauga is tuning in, so hello to you guys. Um, I in no way represent myself, but represent the professional communications team that we have at the city of Calgary. Uh, it was a great honor to work alongside this team uh, during the flood of June 2013. Uh, my background, I was a paramedic for a bunch of years and uh, a corporate spokesperson, public and media relations with the uh, paramedic service, uh, which really got me switched on to the idea of communications. I was trying to make that leap from response to communicator and this institute has helped me make that leap and uh, has really allowed me a venue to apply my practical knowledge of commanding crisis events to now helping, uh, helping and shape the communications around uh, crisis events. And so it's my uh, gift back to, to come and talk to the university to say thanks for that gift. And here it is. Um, so let's just set the stage on what was happening in Calgary of June of 2013. We have major flooding. Remember, we are still under a state of local emergency. The roar of the river is terrifying. Parts of the city are complete ghost towns. 75,000 people have been told to leave. These are tragic circumstances. The Trans-Canada Highway, gone. The Bow River looks like an ocean. I don't think any of us have ever seen anything like this. There is a whole spirit throughout Alberta and southern Alberta that uh, we're not going to let this beat us down. We're going we're gonna to build back. We're going to be better. We're going to be stronger. Southern Alberta is a, a community that helps itself. All of the services that have come together has been a huge team effort. The people out there over the last two weeks have absolutely blown us away. They are living the good neighbor. I have lots of family and friends that are helping and it's great. We got fantastic help. I've never seen such energy for the community spirit. I don't know who has inspired who, but now we're in a position where everybody is inspiring everybody. The spirit of our city! Everybody's been so helpful, it's, it's possible for me to thank them. When visitors come for the Stampede, they may not see Calgary at its prettiest, but they will see Calgary at its best. We wanted to see the Stampede event go on because we think it's an important event uh, for Calgarians to have an opportunity to celebrate, even in uh, adversity. So what I love about that piece is it really encapsulated just how much river water was flowing. Three times the amount of uh, water that flows over Niagara Falls was coming through the city of Calgary and other communities of southern Alberta. And it also, I think, really highlights and captions the spirit of our city. Uh, Elaine, you can say, yeah, Calgary. Um, Calgary's a great uh, spirit. Uh, the, the, the people really rallied together in times of adversity, and which was one of the aces in our pocket for this event. Um, I spoke at Mount Royal University last week. It was a Bachelor's of Communications class, and I asked them, how do they define crisis? How do you define crisis? And in my own research, there's lots of ways to define crisis. Um, I now define it when you go to work and the mayor, the premier, and the prime minister are all standing in your office. You're having a crisis. <laughs> that, was, that was apparent to me on that day. Um, you know, in, in, in any learning or any plan building or any education or any thought around crisis, we look, I look back at the Chinese who use two brush strokes when they spell 
crisis, and it really reflects danger and opportunity, threat and opportunity. And we see this now as an opportunity to learn and to share our story and with what we've learned with the community that surrounds us. That's kind of why I'm here today, to share that story. I'm going to try to touch both the disaster management and the communication folks. Um, so what does the flood mean? What is that? What was really happening for the flood? We all refer to it as a flood, but that one crisis was actually four crises in one event. Uh, we had a flooding event. We had a significant loss of infrastructure event. We had a mass evacuation of our entire down core event. And then just to top it off, we thought we'd have a train derail and hang over top of the Bow River. Right, so this was four crisis events in one. Um, so for my role, to when, when the city of Calgary responds to a crisis event, my role is an essential relationship with Calgary Emergency Management Agency. So within our corporate communications group at the city of Calgary, I would essentially view SEMA as one of my clients. So when SEMA activates, we go and support them as an agency would. Uh, my corporate crisis communication plan is a critical annex to the uh, municipal emergency plan, which, by the way, on June 19th, the plan that I was writing was about 75% complete. I was hired in March with the City of Calgary and said, we need you to audit and uh, update or write us a crisis communication plan. I said, great, happy to. Did some pretty profound research, found some best practices, drew it all in, was putting it in a bright, shiny document, and it was about 75% done. So on June 20th, when we walked into the flooding event, we had no plan, except what existed prior that was pretty well outdated, and we had no really team structure. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then uh, my office also looks after how do we support uh, urgent communications outside of regular business hours that aren't necessarily a crisis. <clears throat> so when the flood happened, uh, we really didn't know what to expect. Uh, June 19th on the way home, I sent our water services department an email and said, hey, how's it looking? And uh, the reply was, yeah, the rain's at running at this. This is the forecast. We've lowered the reservoir. Shouldn't be a problem at all. The next morning, I was on my way into work. I was riding the C train, our light rail system. And it was raining so hard that the operator had to keep coming over the loudspeaker to say, if your door won't close, would you please use the sleeve of your jacket and wipe off the sensor? Because the rain was batting so hard, the sensors weren't able to close the doors. Because then I kind of got that spidey sense that, uh... And then as the train came to a complete stop, my phone started to ring, and it was SEMA saying, we need you up at the emergency operations center. At that time in the morning, we still didn't have a complete picture of what was happening. The forecast still wasn't jiving. It wasn't really apparent what was coming. What actually really provided us some really great um, lead time was some astute people in our 911 call center who was looking at what was happening upstream, the calls that were coming in, the types of calls that was happening in Canmore, saying, if that's happening upstream, it's coming this way. So at, shortly after 8, about 8.20 in the morning, oh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Um, what was happening was 200 plus millimeters was uh, falling on our on the uh, watersheds. So in Calgary, we've got the Rocky Mountains, the foothills just to the west of us. And so May, June, we start to get the glacier melt. That water is flowing down into the into the rivers. And then we also get when we get significant rainfall that mixes in, it accelerates the melt and dumps it all into the river. Um, so that water was coming downstream. Uh, this picture, just as a side note, our beautiful historic Center Street Bridge, there's a lower drive deck under there. You can't see it on the far end of the picture, but it actually ended up working as a funnel and taking the water and just redirecting the water straight into our downtown core. Um, so we haven't seen water like this since the 1900s. Uh, we started seeing it impacting Canmore and moving its way down through Bragg Creek. Uh, the Elbow River, so it's the small river that comes through uh, our main, it's the main source of our drinking water through the Glenmore Reservoir. When it peaked, it was peaked at a one and a 500 year return. 
a lot of people in Calgary and the world are saying, one in 500, that's great, we don't have to deal with this for another 500 years. But that metric actually means there's a one in 500 chance every year that it could occur. So we're actually looking at it as a possibility for next year as well. The Bull River was peaking at the one in 100 year return. And there's some language in there about the confluence of the rivers, and that's where both rivers meet and join in into the Bull River. Uh, so as this started, uh, as we started recognizing that there was a uh, potential crisis occurring, the Calgary Emergency Management Agency kind of took uh, over control of the response. And at 8.28 in the morning, they activated the Municipal Emergency Plan. What that Municipal Emergency Plan does is it says to the community, we're at risk, and we're at risk of not being able to effectively manage this on our own. So under an MEP, it gives the Director of Calgary Emergency Management Agency sole directive uh, control. At, uh, at a, just after 10 o'clock, I think it was, we declared a state of local emergency. State of local emergency gives the Director of the Emergency Management Agency powers um, unbelievable. You know, if there's a pump in China, we can go to an airport, get a plane, and fly to China, pick up the pump, and bring it back. We can walk into Canadian Tire and say, we need all of your pumps and fill shopping carts and take them away. So it gives that kind of level of authority. The bill comes afterwards. But. Um, so at that point, what was most interesting for us, by 10 o'clock or shortly after 10, when we declared a state of local emergency, a lot of us were still scratching our heads, saying we don't get it. Because you look out the window and we don't really see, we don't get it. What's, what's the emergency? What's the crisis? Yeah, it's raining. But the director, Bruce Burrell, uh, an amazing and inspiring man, he knew exactly what he was doing. He's done the research, he's played the game, he knows exactly what he's doing. And his response is, we need that state of local emergency so we can get things done and get it done now before it comes. So we started evacuating our, uh, our communities. Uh, mandatory evacuations began. As the situation continued to expand and grow, we recognized which communities we needed to evacuate in what order. By the end of the day, we'd evacuated 32 communities and 80,000 people. That number in itself sounds really impressive. Wow, you got 80,000 people out, 32 communities. But let me challenge you with this. In any evacuation plan that you have, when you talk about evacuating 80,000 or 100,000 people, do you process and think that within that group, there are retirement homes, nursing homes with dementia patients, our downtown core is the primary residence for our vulnerable and homeless populations, mental health patients. We had to evacuate women and children that were in emergency shelters. At the same time, we were evacuating addicts and treatment programs. So the, the people and the, the populations that we were trying to evacuate and house where all of our previous experience was, there's a massive condo fire, let's get everybody out of the condo and get them into a shelter. It's very simple great, easy, streamlined process. But how do, you, how do we possibly mix all of those people together and keep them separated and keep them in different shelter homes where that's appropriate for them? So that was kind of what we were faced with during the evacuation process. Our downtown core was flooded and that meant we lost our city hall, we lost our public building, we lost the Manchester yards. It meant that the giant oil and gas companies were closed, whether they liked it or not. The numbers were staggering, like $5 million a day that some of them were losing. Every day they were kept out of their office buildings. So the impact of what was happening was astronomical. Uh, the, stand, the Saddle Dome, the Stampede Grounds, and the Calgary Zoo were uh, incredibly impactful. My heart breaks every time I think about the zoo. Uh, but they successfully evacuated all the animals, with the exception of a few, off the island into high ground within 12 hours. It was a feat... Uh, that was pretty miraculous. Feel free to throw up a hand at any time if I'm going too fast, but, um, if you have any questions. So um, interestingly enough, the city infrastructure, uh, if you look at the amount of water that was flowing through the city of Calgary and through our waste, or through our waste and our treatment plants, to keep and maintain safe drinking water for the entire city was an incredible feat. That was part of the resiliency work that the city had done prior to. Uh, about five years ago, the city invested several million dollars to upgrade the water treatment plant 
because of that upgrade, we were able to keep fresh, clean drinking water for our citizens. Uh, we had to close LRT stations. We lost parks, flooded pathways, bridges, road closures, pedestrian bridges. The impact was so massive. Uh, one of the interesting stats coming out of the flood was we evacuated 80,000 people. We only sheltered in reception centers 3,000. So that says to us that 77,000 people found other accommodation. They stayed with family, they stayed with friends. People put on posts on Kijiji saying, hey, if you're out, come stay with us. Everybody in the city of Calgary was impacted in one way or another. 80,000 out of 1.2 million people were directly impacted, but the entire city was affected. Your mother was maybe you know, evacuated out of her nursing home, or you opened your doors to people to come and stay with you. 6,000 homes flooded, and 35,000 NMAX customers were without power. Because of all the water, we had no, no choice but to shut off the entire power grids, just to keep people safe. Excuse me. So we set up reception centers. We took over our uh, recreation centers, churches, schools, wherever we could find geographically central and, and feasible and accessible uh, locations. Even though we had prior marked uh, reception centers, um, they were not, not necessarily accessible because of the roads and the pathways. So the response, um, and again, my, my area of storytelling is about the communications not so much the operational uh, as far as the responders go. So moving into a communications perspective, um, Ipso Rees just did a uh, citizen satisfaction survey for the city of Calgary. And 99% of Calgarians say that they're satisfied or very satisfied with the city's response to the flood. And 95% said that they were satisfied or very satisfied with the communication received from the city during the flood. So I think that's a... Uh, a tremendous value. This is, if you don't, if you know Calgary at all, this is McLeod Trail uh, going northbound into downtown. And the entire uh, two, the entire two east lanes plus the shoulder were washed out and it took out the, the LRT tracks as well. Just to give you a, a sense of the thinking around flood response, uh, our roads people had all the engineers sitting in a room together and the director of roads says, okay, we need to fix this road in one day. How are we going to make it happen? And so they all talked about all the different options, what they were going to do. It was actually a recent hire, a new young grad to the city. And as they were going over all of the, uh, how we're going to fix the road, how we're going to fix the road, he put up his hand and said, why don't we build a new road? And they all stopped and looked at him and said, what? He says, well, you see here, there's enough room. We don't need to do all this repair because there's power lines and fiber optics and everything under there that was impacted. We don't need to do all that. We can just go around it. And then we can come back and fix all this stuff. And then we can fix the road rather than doing all this work and then digging it up to fix this. Right? So in one and a half days, the city put together uh, one kilometer of three lanes and built it overnight. It was just incredible, the response that was happening. So um, from a communications perspective, this, I think this was one of our key success points. It was also one of your most troubling bang your head points, was our mayor, uh, Nahid Nenshi, an amazing, brilliant man. Um, community love him, and top two most influential men in Canada Now by McLean's Magazine. An amazing, amazing man. It was an honor to work uh, with him. But essentially his philosophy was, if we know it, Calgary, Calgary needs to know it. And that's right in line with open, clear, transparent, honest government. And, and I love it. It was a challenge at times though, because you would do the mayor's briefing notes and do the briefing in the morning and say, and we don't really know if you should go here yet, sir. And he would stand in front of the media and say, and I'm not supposed to say this yet, but. But it was his belief that if we knew it, Calgary had to know it. And that, I think that really added to our credibility. And it really, uh, I think, exemplifies what government is moving towards and where we need to be as organizations. So 
From a communications uh, look, we really took these, uh, this 3C perspective. And the three C's when we were doing communications was consistent, comprehensive, and credible. And that was throughout, throughout all of our communication uh, channels and tools. So for consistent, we really wanted to break down um, and differentiate between information and communication. Traditionally, Tom, correct me if I'm off base here, but traditionally during crisis, Communicators would go out and get as much information as they could, make sure it's a robust, dynamic uh, briefing that's put together, get the approvals and push out the briefing and, and send out the message, which could take three, five hours, right? By the time it's three to five hours in, it's old news. Where we really wanted to be was leading the conversation. We wanted Calgarians to turn to us as the source of credible information. So we, diff we, split, we split it and said, what's information and what's communication? So information is McLeod Trail, you saw the picture. McLeod Trail at 25th Avenue is closed. There's no denying that, that's reality. You can see it, look at the picture, it's closed. That's information, let's push it out. That bridge, that pedestrian bridge, it's gone. That's information. The train isn't running here anymore. That's information. City Hall, it's closed, it's information. Communication is all of the pieces that required specific strategy. So we're gonna let Calgarians back into their homes and here's the process they need to go to make sure they're safe. We can't take a risk on public safety. So the communication and the strategy behind re-entering your home is A, B, C, D. And this is approved messaging from the electrical company, the gas company, the permit guys, the inspectors, we all agree, this has been developed and this is strategized. Red Cross came out with some uh, debit cards that they were providing to people that were directly impacted by the flood. Well, what's the process to get those debit cards? Who's, who's eligible, who's not? Where do you go to get them? What are the hours of operations? That's communication, that requires strategy and approvals. Um, so we also, so we had information communication we also did a rigorous schedule of media briefings. So we wanted people to always know that they could learn something new by turning on their TV or switching on the radio. We were very fortunate in this event in that during crisis, media want to go get the pictures, right? There's the explosion. They want the pictures of the, the fireball, the smoke, the fire trucks. They want to talk to people that are affected. But because our crisis was so massive, there was nowhere for media to go. Calgary was closed. So our emergency operations center, state-of-the-art technology, one of the best in North America, got a little pushback during the build, but is being hailed as a savior today. Our uh, emergency operations center has a beautiful media briefing room where they can all come in, plug in. Those wires go outside to the boxes where the satellite trucks can plug right in. So we were able to accommodate all the media and say, look, we want to keep you informed. We want to keep Calgarians informed. You come to us and we'll continually feed you that information. So they literally camped out, brought in pizza, brought in pop, made sure they were happy, made sure that they always knew when the next briefing was going to be, who that briefing was going to be with. And we kept a rigorous schedule, making sure they had new content for their six o'clock, for their noon, for their six, their 11, always pushing out what's new, what's happening. We also use social media quite a bit. This is a very interesting piece for me. Um, towards the end of my Royal Roads journey, my research project was looking at social media and emergency management and crisis. And the ideas that I learned, I thought were pretty good. Social media, it's the way of the future. It's a, a dynamic tool, it's a must have. I looked at incidents like the Virginia Tech shooting, where yes, social media was critical. Students hiding behind their desks, pushing a tweet that the shooter just passed by classroom A17. It was critical in helping the responders find and track the shooter so that they can mitigate that issue, right? So I did this, I was gonna say great, but I had to stop myself. I did this okay research paper. <laughs> As I said to my professor, no thanks, I'll take the C. Um, and really thought that I had learned a lot about social media. I submitted that paper two weeks after we walked out of the EEOC after the flood. 
wishing that I could rewrite the thing and just talk about the experience I had in the flood because what I thought I had learned in my paper, yeah, there were some learnings there, but a whole new element and a whole new richness that I learned uh, during this experience that I'll touch on in a few moments. But what I really appreciated most about the social media was it was a channel to quickly spread your message. It encouraged and it stimulated conversation. So even if you're not following the city of Calgary, you might be going to school to drop your kids off and the person that's standing in next to you has just read something on their smartphone and says, did you hear that they closed downtown? It creates and stimulates conversation. So I, we were able to get information out quickly and spread the news through our social media channels. And on that note, we took a very uh, multi-channel approach. So if we posted something in our newsroom, you would find that same thing on our Facebook page, on our Twitter, you would find it on our blog. It was redundant. We never posted one, one piece of information and asked people to go look for it. We posted and connected and reconnected and connected. Right? We always made sure that it was fluid and was available on multi-channels. And then redundancy. Redundancy was key for us. Uh, making sure, this goes back to my, my days as a 911 when I used to answer 911 calls. The simple philosophy that they taught you then was repeat your message. So when I answered a phone call from a, from a woman who was screaming that her baby was not breathing and I needed to know where she lived so I could get her help, I had to repeat. Stop screaming so I can help your child. Stop screaming so I can help your child. I need you to stop screaming so I can help your child. They would stop because they heard that message repeatedly. So we did the same thing. We repeated our message. We never wanted to be quiet, never wanted to be absent. We were always, in that, uh, always involved in the conversation, and we did that redundantly, making sure I'm not missing anything on my notes. Um, comprehensive. So to ensure that we had comprehensive communication, again, we we're very fortunate to have this great emergency operations center. If you can imagine uh, a room that looks like you're launching the space shuttle out of it, looks like NASA, 65 workstations in one open room with 38 big screen TVs mounted on the wall with a real operating picture, live news streams, social media feeds, and a room full of people from different agencies from across the organization and from our regional partners. What that did was it allowed us to create comprehensive communications. So rather than trying to create or imagine and then track somebody down to verify information, I was able to pick up my notes and walk across the room and say, where's the guy from water? Where's that gal from the education? Where's, I'm looking, I need somebody from bylaw. And I'd be able to pick them out and run over there and say, hey, we're creating this. Can you verify this information? We need to make sure it's as detailed as we can. So when we're creating a re-entry brochure, we need to make sure that everything's in there. All the information from the gas company, all the utilities, from the building inspectors, from the fire, from the public safety, from the law enforcement, it all needs to be in there. And we can gather all of that right in our emergency operations center. Um, Having said that, although we're fortunate in Calgary, it doesn't require a multi-million dollar facility to do that. You know, traditionally, email connection, telephones, blogs, live chats, Skype interviews, whatever it takes to get the right people in the right time to provide the right information. Um, so in our EOC, again, because we're under a state of local emergency, we are also um, able to work with our partners. So we had representatives from the zoo, we had representatives from the Stampede, we had representatives from the Board of Education, ATCO, our uh, utility people, they were all in the same room. That provided uh, coordinated, comprehensive messaging. We did not want the NMAX, our power utility, pushing out messages saying, we're, de we're re energizing grid nine at the same time, emergency responders are pushing out, there's going to be no power for the next three days. We needed to make sure that all of the communication was coordinated and as comprehensive as could be. We also made sure we had one point of contact. So from a, an approval process, everything had to go through the director of, um, everything had to go through the director of SEMA. So that he was aware of every communication that was related to the event 
and then make sure that there was no inconsistencies. The one great piece about our structure was we had the, the will to repurpose any information. So once we had information or a communication that was approved, we didn't have to go back for, pre or for future approvals. In days past, you can imagine somebody sitting in a social media chair saying, uh-oh, here's a tweet. I want to reply. I got to go get an approval. We're at a position now where we say, oh, here's a tweet. There's the information. We just pushed that out an hour ago. Yes, we're just going to reply because we're repurposing and reusing that information that has already been created. So the one point of contact made sure that there was good communication flow from here to there. Yeah. He has an act. He has an acting director. So if he's not in, then there's an acting director. So you always call him director. Um, the other, the other great piece that we had from a, from a emergency operation perspective in the center was communications was a critical element at the table. So if you look at the command structure, uh, we often have what's called a sit rep situation report. And at the front of the EOC, there's a large work table and all of the organizations, representatives from each organization stands around the table for each sit rep and they go around the room police, what's happening, fire, what's happening, utilities, what's happening. Communications is now a critical piece at that table. We stand at the table and inevitably people always look to communications because NMAX will say, we need to do this. Well, that's going to require, guess what, a communication strategy. The planning department is saying, we need to figure out how to get people back into their homes. That's going to require a communication strategy. But the other piece is that now communications is able to stay at the table and say, Actually, the community is really needing to know this. This is what's top of mind to the residents. This is what we're hearing. This is what's important. And sometimes they don't care about what you're working on right now. This is what they really care about. This is what they need to hear. So we really worked through all of those channels and being present at the front of the room to make sure that all of our communication was comprehensive. Very. <laughs> we, had, um, we have a very dynamic team. The city of Calgary is quite fortunate that um, for several years they've placed communications as a priority, uh, one of the priorities. Certainly all of our business units are, are important, but we recognize and have recognized for some time that communicating effectively to our internally and to Calgarians is, is a priority. So we have a pretty dynamic um, team that we're able to draw on. So we were able to uh, effectively manage all of our communication tools with all of our uh, communication staff that we had available. It was several, yeah. So um, the, I can't give you the exact number, but um, yeah, we, so our crisis communication team is about 36 people. Yeah, uh, you know, so I'm going to rebuild that and it's going to sound crazy. Our crisis communication team is 36 people. I'm going to make it six moving forward, right? I know it sounds crazy, but there's actually logic behind it. But um, yeah, so we had adequate resources. For the event, uh, for the crisis flood response, we drew communicators in that have never been a part of a crisis communication team. I've had no orientation. I mean, we were making up roles in the moment, right? So in the crisis communication plan, we have one reception center communicator. We had nine reception centers. So we actually created a role called reception center support in the EOC. because so we needed one person to manage all of those nine reception centers, right? For this event, uh, you know, we have one role, one role called media relations. But for this event, we needed one role that was specifically, and I'm, I'm making up names now, called executive media support. One role to follow the director and the mayor, and here's your briefing, here's your briefing, here's your briefing, right? That became a full-time job. So we were very fluid and very responsive to the needs of the event as the needs came up. And then credible, um, credible information. Again, what was really great was our mayor 
and Director Burrell. So, Director Burrell. Uh, today, Director Burrell is Chief Burrell. He's Chief of the Fire Department. And SEMA, the Emergency Management Agency, is a division or a subgroup of the Fire Department. And a Deputy Chief of the Fire Department is currently Acting Director of SEMA. Chief Burrell can only be the Chief of the Fire Department or the Director of SEMA. He can only wear one hat. So today he's fire chief and a deputy is the acting director. When we activate and have an MEP or we declare a state of local emergency, he takes off his chief of the fire department hat and steps over, puts on his Calgary Emergency Management uniform, and he now becomes the director and a deputy fireman becomes the acting chief of the fire department. So that's why we get lost. I get confused between director and chief. So Director Burrell, uh, I've known the man for several years and I have a tremendous uh, newly found respect and admiration for his character and his intelligence and his direction. He's got a mind, uh, his mind is like a steel trap. I could call him up right now and say, hey, what was the flow of the <clears throat> Bow River below the confluence on June 26? And he would tell me. <coughs> you know, he just doesn't forget anything. So. What kind of evolved for us that one of our learning pieces is going to be is we really spoke to Calgarians to the head and to the heart. Excuse me. And by, and by that, I mean, we would start the day off with a media briefing with Director Burrell. And he would stand in front of Calgarians and he would, here's the facts, here's the information, here's what we're doing about it, here's the logistical issues, here's the challenges, and here's how we're going to overcome them. The next briefing would be our mayor, who would say, hey, Calgary, I hear your pain. I've seen your, I've been in the community. I've seen how this has affected you. I've, I've seen how this has affected you. It resonates for me. Here's what's important to us. Here's how we're going to take care of you. Here's how we're going to move things forward. And then the next briefing would be the director. Here's what we've accomplished today. Here's our challenges. Here's what's happening next. And this is what you can expect. Following briefing would be from the mayor, who would speak to the heart. So we were trying to connect with Calgarians on both an intellectual and an emotional level, which kept them engaged. We also had the great fortune of being in that EOC to have the appropriate resources. So when challenged with the question about why haven't you turned the power onto that beautiful Bow Tower building downtown, the director didn't have to make it up. He could say, that's a great question. CEO of NMAX, how would you like to answer that? And the CEO of NMAX would answer the question. Or the director of roads, or the director of water. We were all in the same building, all in the same room, and available to speak to the issues that were present. So we really added that credibility by having the right sources of information available to speak to the media. And then the depth of our relationship. Um, with the Emergency Management Agency, We've really created depth of relationship in working with them over the years. And that allows, I think, from their perspective, is to know that they can trust that we're going to do the right thing and respond the right way. Um, from a credibility piece, one of the interesting things was in an unprecedented move, and it kind of caught us all off guard. Um, Director Burrell. <coughs> You walk into the emergency operations center. If I walk into the emergency operations center and take out my smartphone and take a picture of the room, eight guys tackle me and they erase it right away. It's a secure facility. Swipe in, swipe out, detectors, <coughs> state of the art. No one's allowed to take pictures. <coughs> Excuse me. But Director Burrell on day, I think it was five or six, brought all of the media down into the workroom. And he said to the media, there it is, take your pictures. And his intention in doing so was to say to Calgary, we haven't given up, we haven't slowed down, we're not making this up. This is Calgary, this is the city of Calgary working for you to get things back in place, to get things back in order. This is Calgary responding to this crisis. And it was huge. It showed that transparency he allowed people in to where they weren't allowed to go before. And it was a really, really great move, which added that credibility piece to the city 
and to our response. <coughs> Social media is a, uh, I have a new, it's pretty new, some people have heard it, I have a three hour rant about social media and how it applies to emergency management. And uh, I'm participating now in a social media and emergency management expert roundtable. Uh, it's a project through the Department of National Defense. And it's extremely, extremely interesting. If you're interested, I'll come talk to you about it sometime. But on, uh, on about day four, our manager of 311, our call center, who did an amazing job, by the way. They took over 100,000 calls during our uh, flood event with loss of phone lines. They still kept it up. But he walked into the OC and he, he's an amazing man that I have a new, newly found respect for. And he ripped off a, one of those wall stick it sheets and stuck it on the wall and he grabbed a Sharpie. And in an anger, I think we're all just tired. He wrote on the thing. And he just walked in silence and sat back down. And he wrote on the wall, he said, think like a flood victim. And we all looked at him and thought, what are you, what are you talking about? And here's some stats. <laughs> in the two weeks, we put out 1,500 tweets. We posted more than 200 blog posts. We had 300, almost 300 Facebook posts. We uploaded 280 videos. We had over 150 press releases and uh, media advisories. We increased our Twitter followers from 54,000 to 80,000. We had 1.1 million hits to our website in the two weeks. Our website crashed on day one, by the way. I don't know if anybody knows that. Um, it was genius, though. We switched secretly to a blogger site and started blogging and had IT redirect it. So you still thought you were going to calgary.ca, but you were landing on our blog page. Um, so 1.1 million visits. We had 15,000 new Facebook likes, 460,000 video views that totaled 900,000 minutes viewed. Um, so very, very impressive. Social media was integral for us. Uh, we finally came up with a, a way to find Calgarians to help us volunteer. Um, there was a, an outcry from Calgarians to get us to help them volunteering to help, but because of public safety and liability, it's just, and we were busy, it just wasn't an option. So we came up, there was a, an event where we needed 600 volunteers. So we used our social media channels and we said, hey Calgary, we need 600 volunteers. And if you can volunteer your time, meet us at McMahon Stadium. And 8,000 people showed up, right? So uh, really, really powerful social media. But what Terry meant was think like a flood victim. Who are we trying to reach? Who is your audience? And who, who are we trying to impact? And who is out there in our community right now hurting? And who needs the information? Because I'll tell you something. These people that are trying to save their lives, that are just going back into their homes, that are sludging out sewer back up in mud and silt, who are covered up to their armpits, in a blackened out building. They're not sitting in front of their computers, they're not watching TV, and their phones aren't charged. And he says, think like a flood victim. So as impressive as our stats were, and as great as it sounded to get the message out, who are we really trying to reach and who is essential and critical to get that message? These people, they needed to hear what we needed. And in times of crisis, although we have as much technology at our fingertips, this is how Calgary was trying to connect with us. This is how Calgarians were trying to tell us what they needed. They were ripping apart cardboard boxes and writing on a Sharpie and sticking it with electrical tape to their doors. So technology, communications, social media, we can't forget who we're trying to reach. In my previous plan, who's your audiences? Internal, internals, mayor, council, leadership, business units, management team. Who's your external? Businesses, Calgarians, partners. But you really need to drill down on that on so many levels. There's Calgarians who are directly impacted. There's Calgarians who are inadvertently impacted. 
those who are just interested. So really identifying who your audience is and what communication they need and what channels and tools you need to reach them. <coughs> so some of our, what I believe some of our successes were through communication in the flood. Um, we were successful in getting mass communications to Calgarians. The numbers show that, the numbers support that. The citizen satisfaction survey supports that. We enhanced our corporate credibility. A lot of people right now are looking to Calgary on, on what we can share, what did we learn. And we've increased our corporate social media presence. And uh, what's really great about social media now is I think social media is recognizing the importance of social media. So Twitter, coming out with Twitter alerts. Um, you know, Calgary Police, we joke and say Calgary Police got put in Twitter jail on day one when their account was locked out. You know, Twitter's looking at ways to uh, prevent something like that from happening again. And we've created opportunities for innovation and new relationships. One of the, one of the cheesiest ahas for me out of this, there was, a, there was a tweet that went out once and it said, Calgary floods, where do you think you're getting the best maps? At Calgary Herald? No. At City of Calgary? No. Car to go? Let's go. And for those of you who don't know, Car to Go is a car sharing program. It's popular in the bigger cities. Vancouver has it, Calgary, Houston. So we have Car to Go. And uh, I'm a Car to Go member. I saw the tweet. I'm like, what are they talking about? So I get on my Car to Go account. There's my Car to Go email. And Car to Go is emailing beautiful maps of evacuation zones, sending it to their, to their customers, saying, if you live in this area, you're being evacuated. And they actually did something to their maps that allows cars to go into certain areas. That if it was an evacuated zone, they wouldn't allow their cars to go into these areas. It was brilliant. So I met with car to go after and I said, are you emailing and messaging people about my crisis? And they said, yeah. I said, where are you getting the information? From your website. And you're pushing that out. Yeah. And most of your customers are downtown? Yeah. So in a crisis, can I send you stuff and have you push it out? Sure. <laughs> so there's a, who would have thunk that car to go could be a crisis communication channel for a municipality to reach downtown core people, right? But now actually I've got car to go thinking about how they can do push notifications for me through the mobile app, right? And they're actually now talking about how can we do this in all of our major municipalities. So some really great opportunities come out of, out of an event like this. But at the end of the day, um, it, it, we talk about the successes from, from the city, from the city response. We talk about, well, I talk about the successes from the communication. And that comes from our incredible uh, communication team at the city. Professionals that I just would love to bow down to and say thanks for the ride and for, for allowing me the opportunity to learn alongside these folks because I'm the new guy on the block. But really to recognize our, our, our citizens. Typically in crisis events, there's a, there's a mood swing from day three to five where a community after you know, day one, day two, thank you, Calgary, thanks for getting us out of our homes. You got us to safety. We're alive, great job. Day three, day four, day five, that mood can tend to swing towards, why didn't you give us enough time? Why didn't you give us enough warning? You only gave us 20 minutes to get out of our homes. You've known about this for years. Why haven't you done the mitigation that's necessary? Why, 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 why? We never really saw that in Calgary. We saw this for two weeks and we see this today. We see community coming together and bonding, helping their neighbors, you know, working together to build a better city. We're, we're in our recovery phase now, but we're not just recovering, we're building resiliency. We're looking as a city, how do, we, how do we build ourselves so that we can take a stronger hit next time, that we're not on the ground as, as long as we were this time. And I think that's really the essence of the Chinese brushstroke, is there's danger and there's opportunity. And we as a community, and me as a communicator, are really seizing it as an opportunity. And I think that's like, almost over my 45 minutes, so. <laughs> um, 
I'll thank you very much and then ask if there's any questions from the uh, from the group. Just yes, sir. Ask a quick question. Uh, despite best effort, at some point, um, was there ever inaccurate information that you had to go out and, and correct? And, and uh, how would you approach that? There was um, conversation occurring in the social environment about a boil water advisory. And uh, some of the community started to become concerned that our water system was failing, that we had to be boiling the water, which actually people were expecting because of the amount of flood and the dirt and the water and everything. Um, so that was, that was occurring. And what had happened was Alberta Health Services issued a boil water advisory for communities surrounding Calgary. Somebody saw that, entered something in Google, and they actually found a boil water advisory in our archives from June of 2010. And so they started putting it out there. And so the community started talking about boil water advisory. So we caught it pretty early. It was uh, in the social media uh, arena. And so we were able to message. Um, we're using a, a four box method. It may sound familiar. Um, when we do message creation, what we know, what we don't know, what we're doing about it, and then a myth buster. So as we were, as we were picking up on the boil water advisory, we were able to build into our messaging the myth buster about our water is safe. And we, of course, gave it to the mayor and the mayor would our water's safe, don't worry, our water's safe. And same premise as the uh, dispatcher, we repeated the message until that conversation went away. Was there an agreement between the director and the mayor uh, about messaging head versus heart? Is they consistent with those rules? No, uh, we see that as just something that evolved. And that's one of the pieces that I'm taking, taking away as a strategy. How so? Looking at future responses on making sure that messages reflect both technical information as well as emotional and personal, so on, on both levels. But that was no, there was no strategy behind that. How did the tie-in work with the provincial side things? Like, did you have, were you tied in with their communications people? Not at all? No. No, the only time we had tie-in with provincial communicators um, was a little bit around the, the disaster relief program, so the funding pieces, uh, but that still primarily came through our uh, emergency operations center. Um, There's a small town south of Calgary called High River. Um, it was a very different story there from communications. And uh, we eventually, after we were feeling better about where we were as a community, we did send some support down to High River to help with the communications there. But this is actually one of the questions that's coming out of an inquiry that I'm involved in, and it's at, at what level, right? So if you've got a municipality and then the provincial government has some influence and then the federal government has some influence, where does that communication come from? And I, I'm really still feeling, you know, you look at community, who do they resonate and who do they connect to? And for our community, that's our mayor, right? So who's who's the closest to the community? Who has who's closest to the information? Who's closest to the response? And you know, so it's going to be different in every situation. But because in the Calgary, we had our emergency management group that was so dynamic and so good, you know, that was the source. So we were able to maintain that all on our own. Yeah. A couple of live stream questions. Uh, one from Lee asking, uh, what's the rationale for reducing the size of uh, your crisis team? That seems counterintuitive. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other discussion. So where I, where I want to take the crisis communication team, and it, it requires definition. So currently our team has got a structure of 30 people, but as a responsible municipality, we can't pay for those people to be on call, right? So what I'm trying to do is 80% of our crisis events that we deal with can be managed by one or two people, right? Social media, media relations, and some communication strategies. So the core team that I really wanna trim is having a core team of communication, of communication professionals who are on call, who are expected to 
be available when they're on call. So that would be the core team. And then what I want to build in is this large bucket of capacity of communicators throughout the corporation who are trained and certified or orientated to the different roles that we have. So on, a, on paper, our team would be you know, a core team of two or three people, but we would have the capacity to draw in from all of our communication staff when and if needed. So that's the key issue, right? We can't have 30 people on call just in case where most of our events are easily manageable by two or three people, but we need to build in that capacity to be able to respond. So the team size on paper will look smaller, but I'm gonna build in the capacity around it. And uh, Brett says, first off, Ben, you rock. <laughs> Congrats on graduating. And Thank then you. also, <laughs> which social media app were you using the most for monitoring and disseminating online communications? City Calgary, we're using Hootsuite primarily, um, but we've also been playing with Radiant 6 as a monitoring tool. I think Radiant 6 is a better monitoring tool, but it's still relatively new for us, so we're still experimenting with it and have relied primarily on Hootsuite. Hey, Ben. Um, I thought the engagement, uh, or, or sorry, the, the transparency was, was excellent during the, the crisis situation uh, and trying to give all of the, uh, the external stakeholders that view into actually what was going on. Were there any steps taken to, to go beyond that to community engagement and, and utilizing community leadership in, in some of the decision making structure within the EOC? That's going to be a little out of the communications role, so I don't know exactly how to answer that. Um, we were pretty tight with the community responders, but let me let me throw out there that we do have engagement with uh, BOMA, who's the business, the building operators management association, so all of the downtown core buildings. So all of our high-rises, condo buildings, office towers, they're all part of the management association. So BOMA has a representative at the EOC so that they're able to um, bring communications to their associations as well as bring concerns forward to us. So there are engagement pieces on that. The issue was this event was so massive that I mean, we were full with, with key stakeholder and, and uh, you know, responder agencies. Uh, another interesting thing we did as far as transparency goes, whenever we had a media briefing, uh, we recorded that on iPhones in the same briefing and directly published the entire raw piece to YouTube so that community wasn't just bound by what the media was editing and, and putting out. They could go and see exactly what was heard, the entire conference, the whole piece in raw format, right? So we wanted to make sure that whatever was being said was available to, to anybody. Would you consider doing that as part of your normal media relations practice outside of, outside of emergencies? Yeah, we're getting there. We're actually looking now at live streaming, um, press conferences, mayor availabilities. It's part of that transparent, uh, part of that transparent uh, government piece. Um, what degree of uh, contact did you guys have with the actual dispatch for emergency services? We uh, did not, or I did not, from a communications perspective. Uh, our dispatch center was, it's in a different location. Their backup dispatch center is in the same building, but they were up there. Uh, it's co-jointly operated by the fire department, so they would have tie-in to the OC through the fire department, um, where we really found uh, a key source of information was through our 311 call center. So th the 311 call center reps have a seat in the EOC so that 311 can call down and say, look, we're getting tons of calls about X. We actually use th our 311 call data to plot on our real operating picture so we can look at stormwater, ba sewer backups, and as we get the calls, can plot it on, look for trends, right? So 311 plays a critical role. 911 um, is critical, of course, but they have a tie-in, but they're not directly present there. Uh, the second part, 
was how did you push information to uh, the 911 operators? I'm curious if there was a, a different process than to the public sort of thing. You know, I don't, that's the one piece that I don't have. So we, we are really strongly tied in with 311. Um, and then we rely on, so in the EOC, we have reps from police, fire, and EMS all there. And of course, they do that liaising piece to the 911. We still message really, really strongly that 911 use is strictly for um, you know, emergencies. And we don't take away from that process at all. So if you're stranded and you call 911, it still gets processed as a call and it still gets dispatched right away, right? So that by putting in another piece or another process takes away from that call flow, right? Sorry, I have to go then, but thank you. Okay, see you next time, <laughs> That covers it? Good, well, thank you very much. To you. formally thank Ben for the presentation and also um, uh, suggest that he was where you are uh, not all that long ago and hopefully it won't take a major weather event to invite me back once you've graduated to campus so that we get to continue to benefit from uh, not just your learning but the fact that you can bring your life into your learning. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you.